Hello, everybody, and welcome to Lilith Astrology. I'm Adama, and today I have literally my favorite astrologer in the whole world, Nadia Shaw, and she is just a phenomenal presence on YouTube, a phenomenal presence in the astrology world, and I just really wanted to go in depth and find out what makes Nadia tick and like what does she do in her practice every single day, how did you become an astrologer? How we could empower other people in the space, um, budding astrologers that are coming up. So I really just wanted this to be a time where we go in depth with Nadia Shah. So this is Nadia. Thank you so much, Adama. Thank you for having me and sharing me with your audience. You know, I just think so well of you. I think so highly of you. I remember we spoke like... We just connected a few months ago online yeah. and we spoke very briefly and you just, you just had such a light. And I think almost immediately I said, would you like to make a video for my channel? And That's then so you ended awesome. up blessing my channel. And so now it means so much to me that you are sharing me with your audience. So thank you so much. I mean, it's literally, yeah, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm just like, it's surreal. I just, I've, I've followed you for years and you were actually one of my biggest inspirations to start YouTube. Um, and I just really think it's such a great service for humanity to um, essentially be sharing this information um, and to be, you know, raising that vibration of the collective consciousness. I, I just really think it's, it's phenomenal what you're doing. So that's why I wanted to have you on. <laughs> well, you know, as I call it, uh, moving towards greater love and greater wisdom, right? That's Absolutely. what I like to call it. It's really the awareness. I think we always are doing that anyways, but yeah. when we're more aware of that journey, it just accelerates it so much. And so I like to think of it as putting love and wisdom into the world. And I know that there are so many people who do that. So um, it's always nice to have that acknowledged. So thank you. Of course. Um, so you were saying before we uh, start officially recording, you're in Cancun. Yes, I am. And I'm you're a native to Toronto? Yes, exactly. I have been in Cancun for seven years now. And wow. I uh, was born and raised in Toronto, Canada. And other than uh, a year of university in England, I pretty much lived in Toronto, like all my life. Yeah. Um, but it was only after that year of being uh, an overseas student that I really uh, got the travel bug and I started traveling around. And it was when I came to Cancun that it was just like, I'm home. Like I just knew I was home immediately. And I moved here six weeks later. I um, had Lady Gaga tickets. So I went back to Toronto and the day after the Lady Gaga concert, I moved here. And that was almost seven years ago now. Wow. That's... So what made you feel like it was home? Well, there's one part of it, which is the relocation chart, right? So the relocation you, chart, like, of relocation course. Chart? <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the relocation chart puts my moon right on uh, the descendant. So that's very powerful, right? For home yeah. and healing at home. Um, but, you know, I think that it's tough to say. I think that it's interesting to me as I reflect back on it that. When I was in Toronto, I just always felt like, and because in Toronto, it's what's called my Chiron line, right? So if you're familiar with astrocartography, you know, like there's tends to be like a dominant energy in different places. And yeah. here it's my moon line, but in Toronto, it's my Chiron line. And you can imagine how very different those energies are. Yeah, and so, definitely. yeah. So <laughs> even though I love Toronto, it's home. I lived there for so many years. I had a wonderful life and independent life in the city, you know, mm -hmm. it was great, but it was, you know, always just feeling as if I was striving. And then I came to Cancun and it was like, I can just be, you know, I can just enjoy myself and live my life and have balance. And I really do feel that it was moving to Mexico that dramatically changed my life and my path in many significant ways, especially in relation to my work. Because like I said, up until then, I was striving and trying and trying to find a way in. But once I stopped all that, once I said, you know what, I'm just going to enjoy, I'm just going to be, that's when it really started to feel like everything got into a flow, right? I entered a flow of taking things more easily, 
But then with my work as well, that's when it started to feel like I was making a lot of gains without me having to pursue it and yeah. ache for it. It just happened really kind of on its own. And it's kind of amazing when we do that because it really taught me that honoring your spirit and honoring what your spirit is telling you about where you need to be, it's only the very beginning of opening up even more blessings in your life. Do you feel that um, it was easy for you to just grow your business by switching locations? That was like well, the main- it wasn't so much that I had already kind of, my business is entirely online, right? It's yeah. entirely online. So it's completely location independent. And uh, a few months, I think it was, no, it was a year and a half or so. If I remember correctly, it was a little while before I came to Mexico um, that I had gone to Europe for the summer. And it was at that time that I was writing a daily column in, um, for Canadian newspapers. And so I had a a syndication agreement. I had my agent and I was writing these daily horoscopes. And it was also at that time that I started doing my very first like episodes, if you will, of like location episodes and kind of sharing my journey, kind of like a vlog, right? I think back then, because it was so long ago, it wasn't like 10 years ago. So it wasn't like people were even calling it vlogs. It wasn't that yeah, much of a totally, yeah it yeah. wasn't like a word that people were really using so much it was just me kind of sharing my journey and I saw how I could do it like I could do what I do wherever I am yeah. and so it really was just a matter of like especially in the beginning it was like okay let's take my iPad let's go let's do it on the road so and, how uh, did you yes I feel like you know with with the I don't want to say resurgence of astrology but there's, you know, a lot going on in terms of popularity with astrology and people want to learn more about it or they want to go into the profession of astrology. How did you find that that was your path? Like, how did you get introduced? Oh, that's to a it? really different thing, right? Because yeah. that was, um, I really feel like astrology kind of chooses you. It's not necessarily something yeah. you choose. Yep. And, you know, I, I did an interview recently with someone who said, who chooses to become an astrologer? And I said, no one, absolutely nobody. It's, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's something that if it is for you, it shows up in your life and it moves you towards it more and more. And I just remember astrology being a part of my life from a very young age. Like when I was 14 years old, I was reading palms professionally at a summer festival in Toronto. And, um, I was getting all this feedback over the summer that I was good at this, right? And it was something I had just kind of picked up, but right away I got this opportunity to do it and to be paid for it. And it was after that, that astrology books started coming into my life. And I started learning more about like people in my ancestry that I didn't know personally, but who are part of esoteric arts, I guess you could call it. Um, And astrology being an esoteric art, being a part of that as well. And it was many years after that, that uh, people just started offering to pay me. I mean, I remember working at Walmart and looking at charts before, uh, like in the break room or when there wasn't really a lot going on. And um, it, it was slowly, you know, people started saying, hey, I'll buy you coffee or I'll give you 10 bucks. Can you look at my chart? And it really just kind of grew from there. And then I had my Saturn return. And at the same time, yeah, yeah, that'll do it. I had my Saturn return. And at the same time, I had um, lots of other things going on. Pluto conjunct my moon and the moon is the chart ruler. Like a lot was going on in that chart. Me too. Yeah, yeah. And you know, that's, that's the thing that will, that will get you. That'll really make Mm -hmm. you realize what's superficial in your life and Mm -hmm. what is it actually feeding your soul and also what will. And it was during that time that astrology just, um, it, it gave me so much. It really gave me so much. It gave me hope, really, is what it was. It, it helped me to understand that no matter what I was going through, it was a cycle. And I would be here for this time, and I'm learning something, even if it really, really sucks right now. Yeah. And on the other side of it, at least it'll make some sense. And it was on the other side of it that uh, I went into astrology full time. And that was like 13 and a half years ago. So that was a long time ago. Did you but, feel uh, that your intuition played 
a big part in, in that journey? I think that self-trust plays a big part. Yeah. I think self-trust, which is a type of intuition, right? Because, yeah. yeah, because, you know, it's, um, I think that there are so many messages we get from perhaps very well-meaning people who love us very much about what is good and what is right. And, you know, what is right for us. It is more rare to see uh, and I don't, I think it's kind of impossible to find a person who's never gotten any message from anybody. We get messages about what's right and what's wrong and what's acceptable and, you know, what success means and all of that. But I think that astrology is one of those things, like if it chooses you, that means you have to listen because some people don't listen, right? They want to fight it. Mm-hmm. And if it chooses you and you go along for it, that in and of itself is a huge statement of self-trust, being willing to trust that impulse of what you're interested in or what you feel your soul is pulling you towards. And, um, you know, I was thinking just before we started uh, speaking just now, I was thinking about how, you know, there was a time when it was at the very beginning when I just started into astrology and there was a time when people were like, oh, what is, she? like, especially my extended family. Oh, They're yeah. like, oh, what is going on over there? But now it's not like that. You know, now it's like everybody is so proud of me and I hardly see any, these uh, members of my extended family as much. But whenever I do, it's always like, we're so proud of you and all of that stuff. And, you know, it really just has made me realize, especially recently, that it is always about ourselves. Like yeah. they could not have said that, right? They could not have said anything about what, about their love or about their approval, really. Because yeah. the love we can say is there, but about their approval. But it does show us something that, you know, when it is that you are trusting yourself, it may not make sense to a lot of people. It may not even make sense to you or make sense mm-hmm. to me, um, but it always leads somewhere good. And I've actually, now that I think about it, in my 13 plus years as a full-time astrologer, that has always been the case. I have made changes along the way. I've changed course along the way, and it didn't always make sense to a lot of people. But as I look back at it now, when I was really trusting myself, it always led to something good. Even if there was resistance or confusion at first, it always led somewhere good. I mean, it's led to you being one of the top astrologers. So <laughs> definitely. Um, as far as advice for... But, sorry, can I just say, yeah. because you just said that and I appreciate that very much. Because I was thinking, you know, very recently, this week actually, it feels like, you know, it feels like just now, but it actually feels like a while ago, but it wasn't. It was just this week. But my second book came out this week, and oh. it uh, debuted as a number one new release in the New Age Astrology category on Amazon. And I cried for two days. Like, I kid you not, oh. I cried for two days because I just thought about, and I don't want to get emotional here, but. I mean, I just thought about when I was a teenager, I had such horrible depression. I mean, I really had very brutal depression. And um, there was a point when I couldn't even function. Like, it was so hard to even live. It was so, it felt like such a huge burden to live. And, um, you know, and I think about all those times when I felt so lost or felt so unsure And then to be here at this place, it was kind of like, you know, I felt like, you know how if somebody is a singer and they've been singing for a really long time and then they end up getting a a number one song on Billboard in their genre, like how that must feel. I I was like, I think this is how it feels. Like It was was huge. It was hugely validating. It was hugely uplifting. And um, it it, it just really shifted something in me very powerfully. So, and so... I mean, I just reflect on my journey now and there's so much more to do, right? But the yeah. thing is like you, you just said something like top astrologer. Thank you so much for saying that. I'm like, I think so. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I know. And, and I appreciate, I've had a lot of uh, blessings in terms of people recognizing me and the work that I do. And that means a lot. And keep in mind, I've been at it for a while. Thank okay. Like up. I said, full time, I was one of the very first astrologers on YouTube. Yep. I remember way back when, when I first started on YouTube in 2008, 
Wow. Like there was a very small handful of us wow. on, on uh, YouTube at the time. And I was trudging away and I was making content and doing all of that because wow. it felt like I have to do this. I have to do this. Like in my soul, it was like, I have to do this. And so I went with it. But the truth is like, again, I have these accolades, which is wonderful. It means so much to me. But when I look at my life, right? Yeah. Like when I think about my life, I think, okay, I get to hang out with my dog every day and I talk into my smartphone and I, you know, will edit on my computer. And for a long time, I was just editing on my iPad. Like there was a while when I was really into like doing the CGI, all of that though, and writing books, it's a very um, solo thing, right? It's me and a screen, basically. It's me and my mind and ideas. And that's part of what makes it so fulfilling and rewarding. Like it's a life that works perfectly for me. Perfectly. I love it. But it's, it, it's, um, it's reality. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like there's a nitty gritty part of life. And that really is um, a part or at least that shows me something about this is who I am. And yeah. then you have these moments that come up like, you know, the number one new release in my category on Amazon um, and like other acknowledgements and accolades. And they lift you for a moment, but then that moment goes and you are with yourself and you are in your life, like is the case with me. And so I'm always struck by that contrast, you know, like oh, I'm yeah. not, yeah, like a year ago. Yeah, it was about a year ago, I was asked to walk a red carpet. And that was like such a huge thing. Like, oh, wow, I'm walking a red carpet. And, and I loved that and that acknowledgement and, and all of that stuff. But it was a moment. I don't live on a red carpet. And I really don't think anybody does. Even the people who go no. on red carpets every single day. It's all a show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right? There's yeah. that part of it that is about the external world. And that's what the world is going to do. And then there's the part of it that's about the high moments yeah. and those high moments come, but then they go so fast. Like I said, it was just a couple of days ago that my book launched. Literally, it was a couple of days ago that the book launched. Um, but it was like a moment and it left and it already feels like it's okay. It's there. It's gone. Yeah. But I'm here. You know, I'm here in front of my screen. I'm doing my work. I'm connecting with people digitally. And I'm focused on my next book. So it's kind of like all the other things I have to do, all the other things I want to do, that yeah. creative energy that makes you so feel alive. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah, the creativity makes you feel alive, which is amazing. But being with my dog makes me feel alive in a different way. How did you know? he come into your life? Well, actually, it was my uh, partner who was saying for a while, I want a dog, I want a dog. I was like, no, no, no. <laughs> I have a Sag Moon. I need to be out in the world. I'm not about to have a dog. And then uh, he, he got me to a point where he said, oh, come on, let's get a dog. And I said, okay, maybe a Chihuahua. You know, I thought, okay, a little like dog. A small, yeah. And he shows up with eight-week-old Biggie. Like that night he showed up with eight week old Biggie. And so it's not, it's my dog, but it's not my dog. You know, he's my partner's dog, yeah. but um, you know, he just had my heart right away. He just so had cute. my heart. Yeah. That's how it is. Right. But, how did uh, he adopt him? Um, through a friend, I think. Yeah. yeah a friend. Wow. I think that's he's how a, it happened. He's a big yeah. dog. I mean, they're very good with yeah. protection too. Like they're yeah. very like, protective and. Well, you feel safe when yeah. you're walking around with a, you know, a, oh, a Stafford, yeah. you know, a, a, a dog in the Pitbull family yeah. who's 110 pounds. But I just see this big dork of a baby when I look at him, you know, I just see this very innocent. Uh, and it's always interesting to see people's reactions because it, it really does affirm and remind me that people's reactions is about them. It's not about yeah. anybody else and it's not about Biggie because Biggie is so gentle and, you know, just so loving and curious. And like I said, he's kind of a dork as well. And some people, when they see him, they just smile or they ooh and they ah. Some people want to touch him. Some people get afraid. Some people cross the street. Like all of these different scenarios happen. And it, it's always very interesting to see. But for the most part, wherever he goes, he is treated like a celebrity. He is treated like, I think Biggie Smalls, because his full name is Biggie Smalls. I think um, if Biggie Smalls were still with us, 
when he would go out, he would probably be treated the way my Biggie Smalls is treated. Is it channeling yeah. that same energy? Yeah, yeah, that star energy, you know? Yeah. And he really, and he just acts like it's no big deal and everybody wants to touch him and fawn over him and take his picture and all of that. And um, it's interesting. It's been very healing. You know, dogs yeah. are very healing towards your inner child. Oh, yeah. And so, totally. yeah, it has really made me see myself and my childhood differently as well because I was uh, different looking, right? I was, uh, there were very, very few at that time, very, very few people of South Asian descent in Toronto. Certainly my school, uh. I think there were only my brother and I and another student and out of 600 who were of South Asian descent. And then I was also a really big kid. I was like really tall and strong and everything. And, you know, people would have all kinds of reactions to me. And um, it has really been Biggie that has given me this whole other perspective of understanding. Because when I see Biggie, I just see this amazing, amazing being, you know, like smart and curious and so uh, wise and intuitive. And it just, um, it just fills my heart. You know, it fills my heart to see what my parents probably saw when they looked at me. And I was feeling down about myself, feeling like I'm so weird. And then there's my parents seeing all how amazing I am. And now I get to see that in big. I feel like pets come into your life. Like the universe brings pets into your life. You don't choose them. They, they kind of choose you. It's the timing. I completely agree. Yeah. yeah, completely agree. Sure. My progressed moon went into cancer when Biggie showed up. Oh, okay. And yeah. So all that maternal, awakened maternal instinct has just been poured towards Biggie. Yeah. And uh, it's great, but I'm also really looking forward to my progressed moon leaving cancer as well. <laughs> Get a little fun energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. More fun Leo energy. I'm yeah. really looking forward to that. Yeah, there's a conference, the ESAR conference is happening in um, in September in Colorado. Oh, yeah. And okay. that conference is happening with um, my progressed moon at one degree of Leo. So newly moved into Leo. And already yeah. I'm like on the websites, I'm on Fashion Nova, I'm looking up the dresses. I'm like, yeah. I am going to just be you know, as fabulous as I want to be. <laughs> I'm like, I'm a natal Leo moon. So I, I know. Exactly. Oh, wow. I love it. Yes. That's <laughs> the main, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's my hair, the main. Literally my whole life, my hair has been like, I mean, obviously as a black woman, the hair is always a thing, but like, it's been extra like my whole yeah, life. Yeah. I love it. It made I so much it. sense when I learned I was Leo moon. I was like, oh, now I get it. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it amazing when you first start learning your chart and yeah. so much. Yeah. Like I'm a Sag moon and the restlessness I remember always having like restless and I want to experience and I want to see more and I want to do more. And, you know, now I get it, you know, it's great to be able to see it. Huh? You're a sad son. No, I'm an Aquarius son. Oh, okay. I think I I mixed it. Okay, cool. Yeah. Aquarius son, Sag moon. So that is a very, very restless freedom loving oh, yeah, total, <laughs> totally, totally. not not a combination that is inclined towards you know having responsibilities of uh, a dog and a yeah, child and all definitely. That. Yeah. yeah but so going back to your childhood I, I really feel like astrology has empowered you um and given you more of a voice and it it, I, it really resonates with me because Honestly, I I don't really recognize myself um, as I was five years ago before knowing anything about astrology. And I feel like it did the same for me. And I'm just wondering, what are some things you can recommend to other people who are trying to find, not even just people, but women? Because I feel like we are, a lot of us, our throat chakras are very blocked and we're not as vocal as we could be in speaking our truth. Um, and honoring ourselves. So what would your advice be? And how did you kind of come into your own and get over that hurdle? You know, it's so interesting as you say that, because I was reading a statistic that 80% of all women will develop thyroid issues at some point in their life. 80%. Yeah, yeah, the thyroid. I had that issue uh, show up as well, like an imbalanced thyroid. Um, that was pretty, a brutal time. (laughs) I'm glad that's over, but 
Yeah, I remember when I made that connection as well, like, it is up to me to speak, you know, and that moment when I understood what, you know, my body or what, you know, the lesson has been here, what it is that's trying to get my attention, because I was having so many throat issues for so long, and then it kind of culminated in that. So it's very interesting you say that, yeah, that you share that. But I mean, I'm better now, thank goodness, you know, it really... There was a lot of things that helped move me along in a be- much better direction. And also, you know, all of these things, they have their wisdom, but a lot of the wisdom is what you make of it, right? Yeah. Because I could have just decided not to take it symbolically, not to learn anything and just go along. And chances are the transit would have been over anyways, that was indicating this, and then it would have been done. But because of the type of person I am, I wanted to engage my chart, right? I'm having a interaction, a relationship with my chart where I am learning more about it and it is helping me to learn more about myself. And um, it was through that and through honoring the symbol and finding different ways for the symbol to come together that it led me to those moments where I was like, okay, I get it. I get what's happening. I'm not listening to myself. And really one of the first things I did, I remember one of the really first important things I did was I, you know, previously I had had a business partner that I was working with and for a long time I wanted to have like a subscription membership. And, um, and I remember I wanted it for so long and it was always like, no, it's not the time. It's not the time. No, no, let's not do this. Let's not do this just yet. Let's keep going as it is. It's growing as it is. And then I remember like that business partnership ended up coming to a close and it was when I launched Superstar, like when I launched my membership site, that was the first thing that started turning the energy around because that was me engaging the symbol, a sixth house symbol in a different way. And that was me finally listening to myself, like realizing that I'm the one who has to honor my own voice in the world and for me. And that was really the first big thing I did to say, I trust this vision. I trust what I want to do. And I'm going to go out there and do it. And it really was to, and this was like three years ago, and it was to um, dramatically change my business model, right? Because if you think about it just from a, even though what I'm doing and what we do, it, it's spiritual, right? So it's, right. it's got that emotional and spiritual component. And it's not about the business, right? It's about the spiritual expression, Mm -hmm. but business reflects that as well, right? It's, it's an integral part of what we do at the same time. And so it was in a sense to dramatically change my, my business model in an instant and to just drop that out there in the world to say, here we go, big change. And the thing is though, I knew that I knew in my soul, I knew in my soul that I was doing the right thing. And I remember at the time, I had been stuck at 60,000 subscribers for about uh, three years. So my channel had been on for quite a while, had been on since 2008. So my channel had been going for about eight years at that point. And it had kind of been stuck at 60,000 subscribers for a full three years. And then when I launched Superstar, there were people who got really upset. (laughs) And that wasn't about me. I knew it right away. Like, this isn't about me. Well, it was their own, you know, sense of, you know, it was like, who are you to do this? And their own, it was their own stuff, you know, basically. And I saw it for what it was right away. And I was like, you know, in love and light, I understand. Because what we do ultimately, when we put ourselves out there, we put ourselves out there to have projections thrown our way, but it's our responsibility. And it's my responsibility to not become attached to those projections. So it's very nice when people say, you know, you're amazing or you're so gifted. But the thing is, I, I have a detachment to even those messages as well. And I actually feel uncomfortable with those messages because I really believe in equality so strongly. And I really believe that, you know, I have a skill and I'm sharing my skills, but I'm not inherently any more special or any more gifted than anyone else on the planet. And so there's that part of it. But yeah, I remember like immediately, like within a few days, I lost a thousand subscribers And, you know, but I knew that I was doing the right thing. And I knew right away, this is creating space for more. This is creating space for more. You know, there are times when you can feel that, especially when you've been, I've been self-employed, this being full-time astrologer for over 13 years, 
is to be self-employed for over 13 years. And there are moments like that that happen in any journey that you're taking where it feels like the universe is creating space. But if you become attached to where it is that the, you know, things are leaving or whatever, then it, it's a place of losing power. And instead of, you know, staying focused on the fact that, okay, that understanding that more is coming to rush in here. Yeah. And so it was incredible because after that happened, and I remember it was like literally a year later that my channel hit 100,000. You know, and now my channel is at 130,000, I believe. Yeah. yeah, and it's growing like a thousand new subscribers every single month. Yes. And so and all know. of this, again, it's not about the numbers, right? You, I don't want to get caught in the illusion of the numbers, but it represents something about people resonating with what I share, like is what it comes down to. People resonating that I'm putting something out there that people resonate with. And um, that affirmation, to see how honoring myself ultimately would lead to more of everything good. Um, that really showed me something about, okay, continue to go, continue to trust myself even more and more. And now like with the books I'm writing, they're very different than what I've done before because they are in their own way, books that are focused more on meditation, right? So my book that just came out, The Body and the Cosmos, it goes through each sign and it talks about the, the spiritual significance of each sign and how it correlates to the different muscles in the body. And it's basically me connecting the ideas of Plato to astrology. I'm drawing those correlations. Yeah. Because to me, again, like a true Aquarius, if I'm not doing something that's unique, it's just not worth doing. Yeah. I have a, a book that I've <laughs> written about the North Node and it's like 95% done. But every time I think about publishing it, I think, what is unique about this? Like I have to find a way to put something in here that makes it different than what's already out there. So that's why I've been holding on to that, that manuscript for so long. But yeah, so this book, a big part of the book is meditation, right? Every sign, it goes through like an explanation. And then I talk about specific exercises you could do, yoga exercises and weightlifting exercises as well. And then I do a whole meditation. And so it's all written in the book. And then you can buy the guided meditations as well. Oh, and so really? that's a huge departure from what I've done before. But it just felt right. And it's led to this, you know, milestone moment in my career of having the number one new release in its category. And now the book I'm writing that's just uh, starting advanced sales, but the publication date is in March of 2020. It's called Prayers to the Sky. And it's basically a book about the planets mm. and it's about, you know, weaving together an understanding of the energy and connecting to the energy of a planet. And it has prayers, it has meditations, and it's different than what I've done before. It's really reflecting how spiritual I feel my practice is, mm. the spiritual significance of what we do to connect with divine energies that ultimately are representative of ourselves and, and our own higher selves within us. And I know it's a difference, but it just feels like my truth. And so I'm all in. That's, I'm like, okay, universe, I'm all in. Yeah. <laughs> this, I mean, this I, is what's right. I feel like that kind of leads me to my question about the Pluto Saturn <laughs> conjunction in Capricorn, because I feel like, that's a huge part of it is authenticity, your truth. I don't know. Like, I guess I, I feel like everyone's going through something in that area of their life. And so what would be your recommendation on handling it? Um, identifying what their truth is, being honest with themselves, how to get through next year, 2020. It's like, what would be your, advice? <laughs> well, I would say it takes practice, right? So if you are a person who's not really used to listening in, then what happens is we have moments in a chart like the Uranus opposition, for example. Yeah. The Uranus opposition is huge, right? That happens in the mid 40s. And it's not so much about the opposition. It's about what leads up to it. Like there are a lot of different transits that lead up to it. We have um, the Pluto square, right, which is a big one in the chart, which happens right around the mid to the late 
30s. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Saturn opposition as well, which happens right around, you know, the early uh, 40s or so. Now, though, what's happening is that the people who are having their Uranus opposition now are also simultaneously having their Saturn opposition, right? Yeah. But I actually think that what's even more important, if you go back to the mid 30s, we have what is called the, um, the, the Saturn square. So it's seven years after you've had your Saturn return. And I actually think that that is more important than the Saturn return in many ways, because it is the Saturn square that shows you what you are willing to sacrifice for. Like, what are you willing to put in the time and put in the work for, even if the reward isn't there, even if it feels like you can't get what you want, you're still willing to, to commit, completely yeah. commit. And so it's sort of like the Saturn return ushers you out of youth and into adulthood. And depending how attached you have been to uh, the illusions of, of youth or, or some, something along those lines, yeah. the more difficult it can be. But if it is that you're already a pretty grounded person, you're already honoring your Saturn, right? The Saturn return can be very rewarding as well. Most people, though, don't have a rewarding Saturn return no. in my experience. <laughs> the Saturn square really shows you like, it isn't just about you being in adulthood, but you behaving like an adult, right? You really understanding what it means to be responsible and you dedicating yourself to that path. And then the Pluto square is about being willing to make change, right? Like profound change. And then we get, you know, the Saturn opposition, which again, there's that sense of sacrifice in it. But here's the thing. If you're listening along the way, the Uranus opposition is a time of huge breakthrough. Like it's a time when it really feels like there's big rewards. There's you accelerating your path, uh, feeling leapt into the future. You're really at your best, right? Yeah. We think about even culturally, you see so many people who really hit their stride in their mid forties, right? Like actors and yeah. singers and things. Totally. Yeah. They, you just really are you more fully and and you're able to really allow that to be seen very brightly. That's if you've used these earlier transits well. But if it is that you haven't been listening, right? You haven't really been, you've just been going along and doing, you know, what you think you're supposed to do. That's when the Uranus opposition is, you know, the toupee and the, you know, the red sports car and getting a divorce. Like, you know, all those very stereotypical things. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah like, and, and we see it sometimes, right? It happens. Mm -hmm. People kind of have a freak out. Because they're like, oh my God, like I have not been myself or I'm not me or, oh my God, I have to be free from this, right? Mm -hmm. Because they haven't been listening all along. Like if yeah. you're listening, after you have your Saturn return, you have your Uranus exactly. trine, yeah. right? If yeah. you're listening to your Uranus trine, yeah. you already know what it means to be you. You're stepping into you at that time. But it's that people are like not listening right to now. it. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, that's great. Yeah. That's amazing. It's a wonderful yeah. time. I yeah. remember I was getting my master's when I was having my Uranus trine. Yeah. And it was great because it really helped me to understand the importance of what I do, like to really ground myself in that importance. And, and um, it was really a time of expansion on a level of mind. Like so many great things happen during the Uranus trine. But if you're not listening and if you're not, you know, then that's when the Uranus opposition can really, you know, it can really be a time that's very difficult for some people. So as to go back to your question, I feel like collectively and in our own individual journeys, what's happening with this conjunction of Saturn and Pluto, it is in its own way a sense of this is the reality. You know, this is what is happening in my life now. Is it working or not? You know, what is worth truly, like, what is honest in my life? Put it that way. You know, what is really honest? What is beyond the superficial? Uh, what superficiality am I no longer willing to accept in my life? And depending on what house that falls in, how it's aspecting your chart, that's going to tell you a lot about where it is that illusions are not going to cut it for you anymore, yeah. where you really want to get to the core, to some deeper truth about what is going on in your life. Now, you know, interestingly, it is going to be at this conjunction that I am going to be on a cruise. So the night of oh, the exact conjunction. Yeah. 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 And I'm going to be on a cruise with like about 70 other people, like right about now, about 70 people are signed up for this. 
where even now they're like last minute signups, right? And I'm doing this with a lot of other astrologers uh, as well. But you know, what's so interesting is the way I feel about it. And I remember when I first announced this and some of my astrologer friends were like, you want to be on a boat <laughs> on during the conjunction? <laughs> like, what you, the, yeah. And I was like, yeah, like this energy, <laughs> it's so hyper material, right? Yeah. It's so hyper physical, really. Yeah. And what I do and what I, I'm really excited to do is let's go in the middle of the water right? What we need at this time is more water because Honestly, yeah. Pluto, yeah, Pluto and Saturn are not uh, energies that are compassionate, especially in Capricorn, right? Mm. And it is water that is a symbol of compassion, a symbol of intuition. We need more of that. So let's go out in the middle of the ocean, the middle of the Caribbean Sea, actually, and let's meditate. And that's what we're going to do. I'm bringing a telescope. We're going to look at the stars. We're going to look at the conjunction. And we're going to meditate wow. under the stars and under this conjunction. So yeah. Cool. And I mean, there's nothing else I'd rather do than yeah. do exactly this for this conjunction. Because I feel like in meditation, there is a stillness. You know, there is like, with all this hyper material things happening, you can lose yourself in it. But it's when you're able to detach in a healthy way and understand what's happening at the core of you that it's almost like what can happen in your life. It doesn't even matter yeah. anymore. Like it matters, but it doesn't. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you're connected to what is real and what you have within you. Yeah. If you're connected to that, then you have everything. Yeah. I really do believe that. I think that that is a big part of our our lesson in modern culture in western culture in particular where the oh individual gosh. is the yeah. nucleus of society yeah. the lesson really is if you have yourself you have everything and it is going to be this conjunction that heightens that collective lesson for us in very powerful ways right about now mm -hmm. and in our own individual journeys right about now so yeah i'm going to be on a cruise that's I'm so be, exciting yeah <laughs> i got a balcony i got my own room and a balcony i had to pay for my own room it's all good and I am going to, uh, I, I'm going to be with people, like-minded people, and I'm going to meditate under the stars every single night. I'm really looking forward to it. There's nothing better than looking into the stars. Like, yeah, I, I miss, so I mean, I, I'm from upstate New York and living in Manhattan. I literally like don't, I don't see the stars. So yeah, it's, yeah. It's a treat when and I you know, get I didn't it. realize how rich the sky actually was until I was in England and I was out in uh, in a city called Canterbury. And the thing is, in England in general, like it's actually kind of surprising if you're used to living in North American cities that they don't use as bright lights the way that we are used to in North American cities. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's yeah. one thing. And then being out on a university campus of a small town, really you see everything in the sky and it is remarkable it is really remarkable to see it and you know i i remember there i saw a shooting star and i don't ever remember seeing a shooting star before that or since then for that matter because i am a big city girl at heart but yeah you really um you really appreciate a lot when you actually look at the sky and you know to further that one like I'm really big on giving to charity. Like I, I love doing that. I was raised, like my parents really believed that, you know, 10% of your income is supposed to go to charity. And so that has been a practice that I've continued in my life. So one of the charities that I do donate to um, is a charity called Siva. Like there are quite a few that I like to donate to, like monthly donations. But the reason that I like this charity is that they help people see, like they go into these remote villages and poor countries where oh, people wow. don't have access to health care and they've become blind and the doctors are able to see like, okay, is this something that we can address? And they do. They restore sight to like thousands of people every single wow, year. that's phenomenal. And yeah. And to me, it's like, that is incredible because seeing the sky is so magical. Yeah. It is such a magical thing, you know? So that's the reason why I'm like, yeah, of course I want to support a charity like that. But, you know, of course there's so many great charities out there. But yeah, seeing the sky, you, you can just talk to children. You see children looking at the sky. Oh gosh, yeah. They have stories. They are talking about how amazing it is. It's quite incredible. Yeah, it's such mm -hmm. a treat to see that. Yeah. I guess like, just like, want to touch upon your um, experience in England. So this kind of ties into how you um, 
educated yourself or gotten more well versed in cosmology? Didn't you get a degree there? Yeah, or? so the degree was called uh, an MA in cosmology and divination, okay. cultural cosmology and divination. And it was basically uh, looking at how it was that throughout history, throughout cultures, human beings strive to understand the will of the gods or the or God, right? How they try to align themselves with what they consider divine will for themselves and their life. Mm-hmm. So part of it, you know, of course, a big part of it is astrology. Mm-hmm. Astrology is something that up until very recently, up until the discovery of Uranus uh, in the late 1700s, astrology was solely practiced by priests and religious people, right? Yeah, Spiritual yeah. people. They're the ones who developed astrology to make it what it is. But it was, um, I mean, look, it was wonderful, absolutely wonderful, because astrology is one of the big ways that we have tried to understand the symbols of the sky, tried to understand the will of the gods. However, I remember like we did, you know, we had part sessions where seminars where we looked at passages in the Bible, passages of the Torah, and of the different world religions. And we looked at, you know, a lot of philosophy, a lot of ancient Greece, and all of that. And it was just incredible. We looked at uh, 20th century uh, mystics and gurus as well. And it was just to be really immersed. I think it's as close to Hogwarts as you're going to get in this life. Because, it, <laughs> yeah, right? It was like a full year. And I lived on campus and I was really in it. And it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience to be a part of. And like I said, it really helped me to understand the importance of what we do. Yeah. as astrologers like I, I i came away from that program with a reverence for what i do as an astrologer that was tremendously meaningful to me so i, I mean the program is still offered in canterbury okay. i know that one of my professors recently wrote a book that i shared in one of my videos uh his name is patrick curry he's brilliant he writes a lot about enchantment so this idea of how our perceptions of the world and wonder and he writes about animism and environmentalism and this idea of returning spirit to matter um, I, that I mean he's just so brilliant and uh, so he's uh, still teaching as far as I remember and uh, Jeffrey Cornelius was one of my teachers just this brilliant uh, legend of an astrologer um, award-winning astrologer was one of my teachers as well, Maggie Hyde, Angela Voss, so lots of people. And we had like different sessions with, I think some of the more notable people were uh, like Bernadette Brady, uh, did a few seminars with us. And, you know, so I got a chance to really meet and know like Nick Campion, just really incredible astrologers, incredible minds, and, um, and people who care and take astrology seriously. Yeah. And who have thought about astrology deeply, mm-hmm. that it isn't just about, you know, well, I think Pluto square Venus means could mean this. It could mean this. It could mean this. But no, they thought about why we do what we do and what is underlying it and what brought us here to this moment and the shoulders on which we stand as astrologers, you know, because I do believe that we have a physical legacy, of course, right? Our family, our parents. That's not Biggie, by the way. I don't know if you can hear that dog. That's not Biggie. That's a neighbor's dog. He likes to, he (laughs) likes to have a little fun in the evenings. It's okay. But, um, you know, it's, um, it's just quite profound. It's quite amazing that, uh, to be with these like really uh, brilliant people, to be part of this educational journey. It's great to go to conferences. You know, that's great as well. Yeah. I went to conferences before I went to this program and everything. But when you're there and to meet people who really um, dedicate themselves to this. And, you know, as I was saying to further what I was saying before, one thing I really realized in the academic environment was that we have this physical ancestry, so people were connected to by our blood going way back. Yeah. But when we awaken as astrologers, we have an astrological legacy as well. And we are connected to all the astrologers who've come before us. We share a lineage, if you will. And I think the same is true in philosophical thought. Like if you're a philosopher, right, you are connected to all those philosophers. If you are a Marxist, for example, right, you are connected to that, that intellectual history 
that goes all the way back as well. Whatever you're into, nothing exists in a vacuum. Nothing has come up out of nowhere, right? We don't exist had it not been for all the astrologers that came before us. Yeah. Yeah. And so it helped me to really understand that on a very deep visceral level. And in that way, it was worth every moment, every challenge, every investment, everything that that year asked. And everything I paid too, right? To, To really put it very bluntly. It's not cheap to get a graduate degree. It's not cheap no. to be, be an yeah. overseas student and getting a master's degree. And I had to take out student loans and my parents were just incredible and in how much they helped me as well. And they were able to help me. And I, I recently, actually, it was like a few months ago that I made my last student loan payment. Wow. And yeah, it was a really big deal. I know. Like my student loans all together, they came like my education. If you just look at what my education cost. Not just the master's, but my undergrad as well. It was one hundred and twenty thousand wow. dollars. So half of that was scholarships. Oof. So I I applied for a lot of. I have an eighth house son. I was able to attract scholarships. <laughs> so half of that was scholarships. And the other half, sixty thousand, was student loans. And when I made that last student loan payment, when I called them to find out the exact amount what I should be paying, I cried on the phone. I literally cried. Ooh. Because I felt that on the one hand, it was like a, it was like a, 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 again, a milestone in a way, but it was also to understand that, you know, my education was priceless. It was Absolutely. just priceless. Yeah. It's not about the degree. It's about who you become in the process. And yeah, the formal university environment may not be for everybody. And I totally understand and respect that. But for me, with my Sag moon. I was just about I, to say that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I found home within myself. I understood what it meant to be nourished in a way that I just never knew before. Was it not for my education and my higher education? So I, to me, it was worth 10 times what I paid for it. Yeah. Like, you know, if I had to pay monthly payments for the rest of my life, fine, no problem. Because what I got out of it is worth so much to me. It's, it's literally priceless to me. I'm like, now you've convinced me to look into that program. You <laughs> <laughs> like, might see me in uh, England next year. You don't know. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that program, it's still in the Canterbury area. I know there's a couple okay. of universities there and it bounced around a little bit. And then there's also an online program Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and that is the University of Wales. That's, if I remember correctly, the last time I, I haven't been connected to the academic world in quite a while, uh, but that is Nick Campion's program, and that takes a more historical and cultural view. My program was taught with the Faculty of Religious Studies, so it took a more religious and, and a, a, a mystical, a, experiential sort of perspective. Um, but... I know a lot of people have gone through that program, uh, the online version of an astrology related degree and uh, have loved it as well. So there's lots of ways to go about it. And then I know a lot of people who are just nerds like me and don't have the formal education, but they're brilliant and they know so much and they have so much to teach. And yeah, so everybody has their own journey, but you know, whatever helps astrology be stronger and whatever helps you as an astrologer to feel stronger do it. And what that is, is going to be different for everybody. Right. Yeah. It's uh, I think the moon is so huge. Now oh, yeah. I know I'm biased. I'm a cancer rising, but I think the moon, when you honor your moon, you find peace. That's ultimately what the moon represents in a chart. It is emotional equilibrium, which yeah. is the definition of peace. And so if you look at your solar return chart, look at what the moon is doing in the solar return chart. That will tell you how at peace you feel or what you need to do to feel at peace that year. And in your natal chart, you always need that. Whatever house that moon is in, you need to have time in that house, in that area of life. Whatever sign that moon is in, you need to be able to access those characteristics of that sign if you're going to be at peace with yourself. And we all have different ways of finding that peace, but whatever helps people feel more at peace with their uh, identity as an astrologer, I'm all for it. Well, so my last question is, if you have one more message to give just women everywhere, anyone that may be watching, (laughs) what would it be? (laughs) Astrology related, not astrology related, whatever you want to say. (laughs) I say, you know, um, 
trust yourself, be yourself, know yourself. That's everything. Like really, that's what it all comes down to. The answer to everything that you seek. I, I should write this down. I'm gonna. Tr- I want a transcript of this because yeah, I just I'll came send up you with the, that. the whole video. Like, wow. Yeah, please do. Because yeah. I'm like, oh, I just said that. Trust yourself, know yourself, be yourself, right? Because I do believe that the answer to whatever it is that people are looking for in life, in the world, it is. it ultimately comes down to that in very big ways and very profound ways. Um, the more it is that we are willing to find a place of honesty within us, you know, because I'm thinking about, honestly, what's coming to mind right now is that we see with Saturn-Pluto conjunction right now, we're moving towards it. And we're seeing a lot of pain in people, right? And people deal with pain in different ways. And some people deal with pain in that they turn it in on themselves. They go through depression or intense emotion. Some people project it onto others, sometimes within their personal dynamics. But other times they project like the shadow onto, you know, cultures and countries and stuff. And we've seen that a lot in the world right about now, right? That, That energy is particularly strong right now as Pluto has been in Capricorn, we've seen a lot of that energy very strongly. Um, And so when you tell somebody, you know, listen to yourself and listen to your intuition, we also have to acknowledge that sometimes it is the case that your, it isn't your intuition, you know, it's your pain, it's your fear that's actually speaking. And so I'll give you another example. I read this uh, amazing uh, one of the professional astrology organizations shared something about, you know, what's the worst reading you ever had? And oh. there was one, uh, yeah, like it, they were asking other astrologers, right? It's great. It's Interesting. great. And okay. so one person shared, and it was just so moving to me the way that she shared this and expressed herself about this. Um, and she said that, you know, she went to uh, an event at her university and there were a bunch of people doing free readings And she went to one person to look at her chart and the woman just, you know, said all this stuff that wasn't accurate at all and was really racist, actually, basically like Mm. the, the stereotype that she was expressing, she was saying, Oh, you're, you're thinking about this. You're thinking about this or things, all things that are ultimately very racist assumptions. And so the great thing was that this woman had the support. She went to a faculty advisor right there at the event. She told them what had happened and that woman left. And so she was saying about, you know, how it really made her realize that people project a lot onto that chart. They project oh, a lot absolutely. onto that chart. Yeah. yeah. And it is yeah. your, your own uh, biases about anything because we all have them, right? Like, ultimately, it is a bias for me to say that the universe is wise and loving, right? It is one of those things where I look at a chart and I have had to learn in my practice to honor and acknowledge when things are hard and to honor and acknowledge the pain that people have. And I've come to know this more and more uh, as I grow in my practice and as an astrologer, but it's very easy to be optimistic. I want to be optimistic. Mm-hmm. Again, I'm a Sag moon. Like that's the most natural <laughs> thing for me to be optimistic. But there's this balance, this acknowledgement that life is very, and even when it's hard, it can lead you somewhere good. Yeah. I think that is, that is a real message, you know, to be able to say, yeah, it sucks right now. It's painful and all this stuff is happening, but you're going to be okay. Yeah. That's ultimately the foundation to everything I say. I remember once hearing, um, you know, the late, great Jonathan Kainer, and he made this comment that, you know, at the end of the day, every single horoscope I write is to say everything is going to be okay. And yeah. I think that is the greatest service that we do as astrologers. But we don't do that when we say everything is great, don't worry about anything, nothing is wrong. We do that when we acknowledge the experience, when we speak truth to that person or that chart or that horoscope that we're writing or we're delivering in a video, when we're willing to be honest and acknowledge that sometimes life can be really painful, but it's going to be all right. And at the same time, to look at ourselves, I mean, the more it is that we're willing to acknowledge our own biases, I think that can only help us to be a better and better astrologer, Mm -hmm. which is ultimately 
really rewarding, really powerful. It is a powerful thing, it you is. know, to know yourself, I think is, it gives you power. It gives you freedom, like really the greatest freedom that there is. So it is a journey worth taking, the journey of being an astrologer and the journey of self-reflection, the journey yes. of self-honesty. Yeah. The more you bring that to your astrology, the better you're going to be. Well, thank you so, so much, Nadia. Thank you so, so treat. much, Adama. I just adore you. I think that you are a star in the making. I know that you are a baby astrologer in some ways, but you're also just brilliant. And uh, thank you for blessing my channel when you did. And I am just really excited to see all the amazing things that you are going to do in astrology oh, now, you. in the months to come, in 2020 yes, and beyond. 2020. <laughs> I have no doubt that you are going to make me and a lot of people very, very proud. And I completely mean that. Thank you I'm so really, much. really excited to see what you do. Thank you. Well, everyone, this has been the Lilith series. And my first guest, Nadia Shaw, I couldn't be more happy. Um, and I hope that everyone got something tangible they can take away from this video. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave a comment below and um, we'll answer them. I think Nadia will probably pop in and answer some questions for you guys. And I hope you all have a beautiful and blessed 2020. Bye. Bye.